Welcome everyone to our conversation today. Uh, our conversation is really about uh, one main question. And I quote, are grandmothers an underutilized resource to unlock bright futures for girls in Africa? My name is Telesfo Kabore. I work for Save the Children and Breakthrough Action as a senior community health advisor. And I've known some of the panelists, in particular Judy Obel, for quite some time. I don't want to go back into history. We are still young, but I'm very honored and it's a delight for me to, to be your facilitator and moderate the conversation today. Um, we are being also live streamed on Facebook on the Grandmother Project Facebook page. So before we get started, uh, I wanted to, to hear from you first. We're going to try as much as we can to make this session as interactive as possible. So we might, we might anticipate some glitches in the, in the Zoom and all that, but please bear with us as we do that. But the first attempt is that we're going to do a poll. Lindsay, who is hiding somewhere, will help us with that poll. She, we're going to screen a, a question. And once you hear the question, the, the, it will up, you see the question, it will appear on your screen and you will hit the answer of your choice and we see the results at the end. And here is the question. In community level programs in your respective countries, where you are working, is culture systematically or sufficiently taken into account in the programs? So I repeat the question, in your in the various programs where you are working in your respective countries, do you see culture systematically and sufficiently taken into account? This is a yes or no question. So if it's a yes for you, you click yes. If it's a no, you click no and you submit. Just 15 seconds. Yes, Lindsay. So we'll go one, two, three, four. Lindsay, can you show us the, the results? Great. So, wow. Um, in my own account, we have 77, 78 participants. I'm not sure if everyone was able to vote, but uh, we have almost 52 voters and 69% of those who express themselves are telling us that culture is not sufficiently and systematically taken into account. In, the, in their programming at the community level. So that's really good to know. I think this, this finding, though it's not maybe uh, scientifically or statistically representative, but at least for the sake of our discussion, it's clear that it's, it justifies this webinar that we are trying to, this conversation that we are having today. So thank you very much. So, um, the main aim of the discussion or the conversation today is really to disseminate the report of the Grandmother Projects, um, Catalyzing Change for Girls, and the very positive results of the Grandmother Inclusive Model that is employed in uh, Vilingara in Southern Senegal. We also want to discuss the implication and the relevance of this type of work for strengthening programming for girls and more broadly for adolescents, uh, sexual and reproductive health and their well-being beyond Senegal to other regions in Africa and in the global south in, in, in general. So it's clear that there is still much to be done so that African communities can drive their own agenda in terms of achieving, achieving community, achieving equitable, inclusive and and sustainable development. Today, we hope to unlock a foundational, a foundational aspect of, of, of that and, and 
element of culture that has been overlooked over time. And as you rightfully say, 69% of, of you rightfully say that it's not systematically being applied. So joining me today for this panel are three important colleagues. You know, um, I have already talked about Judy Obel. She'll be our first presenter. She has, um, she's the founder and executive director of the Grandmother Project. We also have Anjali Kohli as a senior research officer at the Institute of Reproductive Health in Georgetown, in Georgetown University. And last but not least, uh, my friend Dixon Chibanda is an associate professor at the Center of Global Mental Health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in London and, uh, and, and founder of the Friendship Bench. So welcome once more, welcome again, everyone. Um, before I give the floor to our first panelist, I wanted to make a point on how the, the conversation is formatted, right? So we will have three key moments. The first moment will be really the time where the panelists are going to take turn in, in presenting their, their reflection and their insights. But after the presentation, we are going to have uh, a question and answer moment uh, Lindsay is going to help us with that. You have a question and answer box at the bottom of your Zoom window, and you can use that to vote and we'll select the, the questions that got the most votes and ask our panelists to attend to those questions. At the end of the Q&A, we will have a moment also using the chat box where we will have you make your own comments and share your own insights based on what you heard. And we are hoping that at the end of the conversation, we'll be able to collect and compile all your insights together and share it back to you. Maybe we can make good use of, of your insights at the end of the presentation and I will wrap up the conversation um, at that point. So this being said, uh, it's really my honor. And, and maybe a last thing also is that the Facebook audience will also have an opportunity to get their answers, the questions being answered. So keep on um, making your comments or asking your question on your Facebook uh, page and Lindsay will help us sort them through. So let's get out of, at it, uh, let's begin. Um, our first presenter, our first panelist today is, is Judy. Dr. Judy Obel has a formal training in anthropology. As I said, we met long, long time ago in Africa. And she's also a public health and adult education specialist. She has worked in Sub-Saharan Africa for more than two decades as the co-founder of Grandmother Project, Change Through Culture. She views grandmothers as an invaluable cultural resource in programs that promote the well-being of families, especially women and children. She first developed the grandmother inclusive model to address maternal and child health issues and later education and child protection issues. She strongly believes in the importance of intergenerational approaches to bring about community wide support for change for girls. Grandmother project work promotes girls education and discourages child marriage, teen pregnancy and female genital mutilation. She has published extensively on culture-centered international development and the success of intergenerational programming. Judy, please, the mic is yours. So take us for the next 15 minutes. Thank, Thank you. you. Hello, uh, good morning, good evening. Can you see my screen? Good. Yes? Can you hear me? Yes, Judy, you are good to go. Yes, okay. Thank okay, you. Good. Thank you. Okay, good. Okay. Um, I think you know the, uh, yeah, the title of the, of the presentation. And I would say first time, 225 people registered for this um, webinar, which uh, is a, it seems to be an encouraging sign that there seems to be quite a bit of interest. And in fact, as you're listening, and if you're interested in the chat box, or, uh, to, I would really be interested to know why were so many people interested, if, if you wanted to, to 
chat that down and write something in the, in the chat book. That would be great. So um, I first want to to thank uh, Telesfor and Anjali and uh, Dixon for being with us today. And also, really, this presentation is on uh, behalf of myself and also my colleague, uh, Mamadou Kaliboli, who is the head of our program in Senegal, and unfortunately, whose English is not uh, strong, uh, quite strong enough yet. Uh, otherwise, he would be certainly would be presenting today as well. Um, so before we get to grandmothers and girls, I want to explain to you a bit our interest in and commitment to the idea of change, change through culture. And so, um, my dear, I'm not going down. Oops. Okay. But what am I? Sorry. Um, so I wanted to, yeah, first to tell you something about the change through culture approach that we've developed, um, and then give you an overview of the Girls Holistic Development Program, uh, a few positive results, and a couple of lessons learned. Um, I wanted to start with a, a quote from um, the first president of Senegal, Leopold Senghor, who said in French, il faut s'enraciner avant de s'ouvrir, which we could translate as, we should be rooted in our own culture before opening up to other cultures. I think that this statement has profound implications for those of us involved in developing programs to support and promote positive change in communities really anywhere in the world. I think that very often we're focused on what we want to change in communities and don't give enough attention to what exists and specifically to the culturally defined values and roles in communities that we believe should be respected and built on in specific cultural contexts. Having had the opportunity to have worked in numerous community programs in Africa, but also in Asia and Latin America for many years, my concern for many years has been the gap between the cultural context, the culturally determined values and roles in non-Western family and community systems and community level programs that we've developed. And I'm convinced that this gap often contributes to limited community engagement and in turn to limited results of programs. A related problem is that very often culture is viewed negatively. It's viewed as an obstacle, a constraint or a barrier rather than a resource, which is how we see it. So in line with Senghor's advice of starting with the community, Let's start by listening to the voice of a few community actors from the area where we're working, <clears throat> a grandmother and an imam, both who make reference to our culturally grounded report, approach. Grandmother Tobo says, culture is the most important thing for an individual. You must know your own culture, otherwise you will be influenced and absorbed by someone else's. We are delighted in the gatherings organized by Grandmother Project that our culture is discussed and that young people participate in those discussions, reflecting her concern that cultural values be passed on. And community imam Abu Kande, who told me one day after a, an intergenerational forum, he said, many organizations have come here to build the classroom, to plant trees, to tell us to keep the girls in school. But this is the first time that a program has helped us to reflect on our culture and what we need to do so we don't lose it. That is why people are so engaged. So I think in, in this presentation, there are a number of key questions that hopefully maybe will be relevant for you to, to think about you know, in, in the future when you're designing programs. Um, Certainly there are many, many programs supporting girls' rights and development. A question is what are the cultural values that are conveyed through these programs? 
because I think it's important to realize that the core values of individualist Western and collectivist non-Western cultures are, are, uh, are very different. Um, while individualist cultures of the West value or focus more on the future, on youth, on innovation, collectivist cultures value the past, elders' wisdom, and, um, and elders' wisdom. And, it's, and their, the role of elders and their knowledge is viewed as a bridge between the past and the future. In individualist cultures, independence and individual achievement are of utmost importance and promoted. Whereas in more collectivist cultures, interdependence and collective achievement are valued. And lastly, but not least, just a few key features of these contrasting uh, characteristics. In individualist cultures, autonomy, especially of younger generations, is promoted and valued. Whereas in collectivist cultures, intergenerational connectedness is valued. And Bishop Desmond Tutu comments on this or draws our attention to a, an African proverb that one of I, that I have heard and that one hears across Africa in different languages, that a person is only a person because of other people. And he refers to, or he relates this to the important value of Ubuntu, uh, the, which, which suggests the paramount importance of relationships and connectedness with others. And Tutu says that Ubuntu is one of Africa's greatest gifts to the world. I think his, his comments refer to the, the value of Ubuntu and other values of collectivist cultures gifts to the world, to Africa and to the world. So the question is, what are, or secondly, what are the culturally designated roles in African cultures that are relevant for today's development program? Malian philosopher Amadou Mpate Ba, many of you have probably heard this famous statement that he made, he said, in Africa, when an elder dies, a library has been done. And another um, uh, proverb that is reformulated, heard in many cultures uh, across Africa, is that an elder sitting on the ground can see further than a young person who is on the top of the tree. Both of these uh, elements, or both of these statements, um, certainly suggest the importance in popular culture in Africa of the role of elders. And, um, so Grandmother Project has been, as I mentioned already, committed to developing a, an approach that builds on these values and roles in African cultures and is centered around or built on four core pillars. First, the cult that cultural roles and values are the foundation for all programs. Secondly, that recognition and involvement of elders, especially grandmothers, is a priority, especially grandmothers, because we work, our work primarily focuses on promoting the well being of women and children, um, strengthening communication between generations, strengthening the role of formal and informal community leaders, and using communication education methods based on dialogue for consensus building, the pillars of our change through culture approach. And in Senegal, the goal of the Change Through Culture approach is to strengthen the capacity of communities to promote the rights and well-being of women and children, especially girls. There are two interrelated programs. First, uh, the first one, which is called Integrating Positive Cultural Values into Schools to make school programs more culturally relevant to children and communities. And as you see here, grandmothers in the classroom sharing their knowledge, wisdom, values. Secondly, girls' holistic development, which addresses prevalent problems in the area, girls to support girls' education and to discourage child marriage, teen pregnancy, female genital mutilation. So why involve grandmothers in programs to support girls? I think the, uh, 
the onion model uh, tells us a lot about the uh, importance or the relevance of involving grandmothers uh, to support these girls embedded in family, community, and cultural systems. First of all, it is impossible for girls alone, oh, sorry, impossible for girls alone to change the social norms that influence them. Second, that social norms are embedded in culture. Third, that cultural authorities perpetuate social norms, but they are also the ones who have the power to change them. And among those cultural authorities are the grandmothers who influence, have a strong influence on community attitudes and practices related to girls' lives. Uh, and lastly, that grandmothers have, um, I can't see, what's the next word? No. Grandmothers have, um, Grandmothers have responsibility for socializing, have central responsibility for socializing young girls. So the Girls Holistic Development Program, um, what is the approach? First of all, it's an inclusive approach involving not only grandmothers, all categories of community members, three generations of elders, adults, and adolescents, traditional and religious leaders, teachers, community health workers. It strengthens communication between generations and between the sexes. It involves leaders of both sexes and all three generations. It's an assets-based approach with grandmothers having been identified as an invaluable cultural asset or resource. It strengthens communication, especially between three generations of women, between girls, mothers, and grandmothers, and uses adult education methods to catalyze dialogue and build empowerment for community-driven change. This diagram uh, illustrates what we, what is involved in terms of the community dialogue for consensus building. We, if we want to, as we see it, if we want to change the collective social norms, the various categories of community actors need to be involved and there needs to be interaction, dialogue, consensus building between them. So what are the activities? The, the foundational activity is the intergenerational forum that brings together the various generations and categories of community members that I mentioned. Um, often in large groups, often in large groups, often in large groups, often in large groups, but um, often in small group discussions with young men, with girls and teachers, with mothers, with grandmothers and grandmothers. Um, days of praise of grandmothers, another key activity to uh, both increase community recognition of the important role of grandmothers. And secondly, to increase grandmothers' self-confidence and commitment to supporting uh, girls and children in general. Grandmother leadership training. All women forums, as I mentioned, strengthening communication relationship between girls, mothers, grandmothers, and female teachers. Another activity in the all women forums, fun activities, traditional songs and, and dances, under the tree sessions, and grandmother teacher workshops so that grandmothers and teachers join hands, strengthen friendships to support and promote the, the well-being of, of girls. Um, just to, uh, Anjali is going to tell us more about the results of the uh, Institute for Reproductive Health Research, but just one result uh, related to the, um, the dialogue process of, of, uh, of consensus building for change the report, uh, their evaluation report states, the Girls Holistic Development Strategy created spaces for dialogue and consensus building between elders, adults, and adolescents, and between men and women to produce community-wide change in social norms related to girls' education, child marriage, teen pregnancy, and FGMC. 
this uh, diagram just summarizes um, some of the key results that, that IRH uh, identified, but also that have been identified through a number of other small studies that we've done. Um, that there have been changes in family and community attitudes towards the different facets of girls' holistic development, that grandmother leaders have been empowered to take collective action to catalyze change in families and communities, that, there's, that there is that the increased self-confidence and empowerment of adolescent girls and increased social cohesion and intergenerational communication, and that these changes have contributed in turn to changes in norms and practices related to the four priority issues, questions, problems that were addressed. A few other of the, of the results of this intergenerational grandmother inclusive program, it has increased communities appreciation of, of grandmother's roles. It has increased grandmother's knowledge on adolescence and girls holistic development. It has increased grandmother's confidence to actively promote girls' holistic development in families and communities. It has strengthened relationship between grandmothers, girls, and mothers to protect and promote girls' holistic development, and has increased support of grandmothers to and the increased support of grandmothers to girls has increased their confidence at school and families and in the community. And two lessons learned to bring about change in community norms. A systems approach is needed in which various categories of community actors are involved, in addition to the risk group, in this case, girls. Grandmothers are an abundant and underutilized resource uh, given their status in the family, their proximity, their experience, and their commitment to girls' well being. I think there's a third. Grandmothers are open to change when an approach based on respect and dialogue is used. And lastly, empowered grandmothers can play a key role in catalyzing change in social norms and practices in favor of girls. And to end, another quote, not from a grandmother, from a little girl. She said, I want to stay in school. If I want to stay in school and wait to get married, my dad won't listen. If my mom opposes his plan to marry me before I'm 18, he probably won't change his mind. But if my grandmother tells him that I am too young and that I need to stay in school, he can't go against her advice the power of grandmothers. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so, so much, Judy. Um, powerful message at the, at the end, in my view. So we are now moving on again. Uh, don't forget, please, to make use of, your, of, of the, of the Q&A box or the chat box with your questions. But please, let's pay attention to uh, the next panelist who is going to present on the, on the evaluation of the Grandmother Project Program done by the Institute of Reproductive Health. So Dr. Anjali Kuli is an applied researcher seeking to build collaborative, ethical, and values-based partnership with local, national, and international organizations to improve programming and research. Through participatory mixed method research and learning, Angeli seeks to advance the evidence and practice to prevent violence against women and children, to improve gender equity and sexual and reproductive health, and to apply social and gender norms theory and evidence to program design. She has two decades of experience establishing partnership, conducting mixed method research, and engaging communities in reflection, advising and learning in multiple countries and settings, including the Democratic Republic of Congo, Uganda, Senegal, India, and Sri Lanka. She leads several capacity building and technical assistance partnerships with various organizations and projects to apply social norm theories and evidence to program. So please, Dr. Kohli, the next minutes are yours. Thank you. Sorry, I was looking for my unmute. Um, so I'm really happy to be here with all of you and to have the chance to present on the findings from our mixed methods evaluation of the girls holistic development. 
Um, I am the work I'm presenting today was done as part of a USAID funded project called Passages, which seeks to build programs and evidence to shift social norms for improved adolescent well being. And we were fortunate to be able to partner with Girls Holistic Development and the Grandmothers Project in this work. In our partnership with Girls Holistic Development, we applied a realist evaluation, meaning that we sought to understand whether the program works, in what context, and for whom. To do this, Girls Holistic Development and our team created a program theory of change. We developed and answered questions created to understand the mechanisms of change, in other words, how the program worked, and then we revised the theory of change and opened up new questions that we wanted to answer. So in today's presentation, I'm gonna focus on one of our main interests in the evaluation, which was how does the girls holistic development approach with its emphasis on grandmother inclusion, foster normative change and affect adolescent outcomes on child marriage, adolescent pregnancy, girls education and FGMC. We, and we looked at a lot of other information as well, really unpacking these mechanisms, but I'm gonna take a smaller focus for this time. So I just wanna show you all the different types of research we did in our multi-year partnership with the Grandmothers Project. And the piece I'm focusing on is highlighted in the red circle here, it's the impact evaluation, which included quantitative and qualitative methods in the villages where they were working, as well as comparison villages. We conducted our research after 18 months of program implementation, which wasn't necessarily the end point for girls holistic development, but it was a point in time where we expected to see norms shift and some behavior change. We worked with grandmothers, girls, caregivers, and community leaders in the qualitative and quantitative research. So what did we learn about community norm and behavior change related to girls' early marriage, pregnancy, staying in school, and FGMC? I wanna start by speaking broadly to the changes we measured in both social norms and behavior change, and then really spend much more time focusing in on grandmother's role in influencing these changes. So if you're interested more in the numbers and the details of social norms change and behavior change that I can always share after in our reports. So let's start with social norms. We saw that families were really motivated in their decisions related to girls' well being by a desire and a social norm to protect girls from pregnancy before marriage. There were other factors that influenced this. this um, these decisions they were making, but the shame associated with pregnancy and the risk of poor outcomes for girls when they were pregnant before marriage influenced parents' decisions to take girls out of school and to act to protect girls through marriage. In the project, we observed that it was also possible to shift the appropriate age of marriage and therefore social expectations to keeping girls in school when grandmothers were engaged to advocate with and on behalf of girls. We also observed really significant shifts in social norms related to FGMC, specifically on the appropriateness of and community and parental support for FGMC declined during the 18 month period when the project was being implemented. So after 18 months of project implementation, in addition to norms change, we measured important shifts in how and with whom people communicated. Communication between generations and genders created space and trust for open dialogue, community reflection on values, and consensus building in favor of girls' well-being. Through these conversations, community members defined new norms that were better oriented to their values. And this created space for parents to make decisions in favor of girls' education, delaying marriage, advocating for prevention of FGMC while also protecting girls from early pregnancy. So how did grandmothers foster normative change? That's what we'll focus on next. So first through the GHD activities, grandmothers became and were seen as leaders and facilitators of change. I'm not gonna read the quote, but please do read it. This happened through efforts to increase grandmothers confidence to contribute to girls upbringing. This was a role that they had played previously and GHD really spent time uplifting that role again. Increasing her confidence involved both building her own skills and sense of self and changing caregiver and community orientation towards grandmothers. GHD was building on community values for elders and their guidance. We also saw that prior to GHD, grandmothers were more socially isolated and people of all ages and genders considered them as living in the past and therefore not being able to offer relevant advice. But through uplifting the values and relationships that existed in the communities, grandmothers went from social isolation and irrelevance to being facilitators of important conversation and change. 
We also saw that grandmothers focused on building relations, the GHG focused on building relationships between grandmothers and girls. This included uplifting that historical role and advice giving that Judy described between grandmothers and girls where they would offer this advice to girls, they would guide them through adolescence. And we saw that girls expressed respect for grandmothers in their relationship as seen by the trust and belief they had in grandmothers taking action. We also saw a bi-directional relationship had developed where girls sought the advice and support of grandmothers and grandmothers sought out girls to offer advice and act on their behalf. This was supported by the quantitative data where we saw that the role as a grandmother's role as a decision maker was an important one and that girls sought their advice for marriage, schooling and pregnancy and caregivers were also seeking their advice. You can see here the percentages comparing intervention and comparison villages and the stars indicate that our, our results were quite significant showing increased um, advice seeking of grandmothers on each of these areas. So what else did we see? We saw that um, grandmothers were taken on as decision makers as well, where um, they, previously they had been considered out of touch with the world and therefore irrelevant to these kinds of decisions. They now had this important role and influence in what decisions were made for girls, how those decisions were made and who was involved in the decision. So people started to look to grandmothers to really guide them on what they should be doing or should not be doing in order to keep girls well. And again, how did we see this quantitatively? We saw that the social norm that grandmothers would contribute to decision-making started to shift. So it, it, the project uplifted this previous role of grandmothers, where we saw that grandmothers were expected to support parents and caregivers in the decisions on delaying marriage, staying in school, and first pregnancy. And we saw that, that confidence in girls' Um, and grandmother's ability to influence those decisions was witness in girls' expectations of what grandmothers could do and also caregivers' expectations of grandmother's advice being important. And that, again, was significant when we looked at comparison and intervention villages. So, so when we think about grandmothers as advocates for girls, we saw that there was a slight difference in the way that they worked with mothers and fathers. And I'm gonna focus in on the father's piece. So the father's piece is that, you know, typically in a lot of families, fathers play this role as decision makers, really um, having this responsibility to take decisions on what happens with their girls at different times, including marriage. And sometimes that, that process would or would not involve other family members and community members. But through dialogue and communication, we found that grandmothers were more and more implicated in those decisions as well as other women, including their wives. And that importantly, fathers found it difficult to act against grandmother's advice because culture holds their opinion as deeply valued. And this influenced the decisions that were being made for girls. Oops, I think I skipped a slide. Um, Finally, we found when we think about the grandmother's role and action to improve social ties and social cohesion, we found that the project really worked through existing cultural and religious roles and values. And this came out both in the quantitative and qualitative data. It was through these strengthened relationships um, and communication between generations with which Judy has really highlighted this role of elders, grandmothers, parents and caregivers, and girls and boys, but also across genders facilitating dialogue that may not have existed previously of listening and communicating with and taking decisions together um, for girls well being. And a lot of that was facilitated through the dialogue and influence of grandmothers. We also saw that through grandmothers' role in the project as facilitators, as centers of knowledge and trust, as advocates and decision makers, communities reported strengthened social ties and social cohesion. And it was these social ties and social cohesion that created a solid foundation for community-wide discussion of girls' well-being. I really wanted to spend a minute just emphasizing that point because I think what had been lost prior to Grandmother's Project and what seemed so fundamental was that social cohesion and communication. And grandmothers really facilitated a shift in what had existed previously through their role in building trust, relationships, and communication. So we had a few key lessons in terms of community norms change and for other projects um, globally. So I'm just gonna highlight a few, but you can read the rest here. We saw in our data that the quantitative findings demonstrated shifting knowledge, attitudes, social norms, and behaviors for girls' well-being, and the qualitative study unpacked how these changes happened and who influenced change. 
Our mixed method evaluation provided strong support for the intergenerational and inclusive dialogue as essential for shifting girls' well-being. And we also demonstrated through evidence the importance of grandmothers to achieving this change, given their status in the community, given their existing relationships, and given the inherent trust and respect that people have for their advice. And that when you work through these relationship building mechanisms, grandmothers' role and influence could really be quite meaningful. Another lesson I wanted to highlight was the holistic approach we see in many projects that people take a siloed approach considering uh, child marriage alone or schooling alone, and the grandmother's holistic approach was quite meaningful to how change happened. And finally, the communities were, were really resonated in the qualitative data with the strategies and respecting the value of their culture as critical to the way in which program, the program achieved change. Um, so I know my time is running out, so I'm going to stop there, but um, I'm happy to answer more questions and share more information as well as our reports at the end. Um, let me see. Thank you so much, Anjali. Thank you for the, <clears throat> the effort to keep time. We, we want to have some few minutes at least at the end to be able to address some of the questions. So thank you. Now we are going to invite Dr. Dixon Chibanda, whom we invited from Zimbabwe to help share his thoughts on the grandmother inclusive work in Senegal and in the wider African context. Dixon Chibanda started the friendship bench in one of Harare's township called Mbari in 2007 and conceptualized the friendship bench where grandmothers serve as advisors for moderate mental health issues. He has been involved in mental health research for many years. Dixon, is a key player in bringing various stakeholders from local health authorities, health professionals, national and international researchers and donors together to form successful collaborations. In his role as principal investigator, he has led the Friendship Bench team through a rigorous exercise of the randomized control trial, which was able to deliver evidence of the intervention effect. Dixon Chibanda is also director for the African Mental Health Research Initiative called AMARI. Um, Dixon, the next 10 minutes are yours. And I want to take advantage of me still having the mic to invite everyone to make use of the Q&A box just underneath your, your Zoom screen. If you have a question you would like the panelists to address, please use the Q&A box there. Thank you so much. Dixon. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to start off by, by thanking Judy and Anjali. Um, really great. Um, the, the first time I met Judy a couple of years ago, I was pleasantly surprised to, to, to learn that the work that I was doing in Zimbabwe uh, resonated so much with what she was doing up in Senegal and we had never met before that you know and so I, I thought my contribution to this webinar would really be more as a way of really reinforcing and emphasizing the need you know for this the work that um, that Judy and uh, and her team have been have been doing over the past couple of years in Senegal. In fact, I, I would go as far as to say, you know, with the great results that we are seeing, my my next question is, how do we take this to scale? What are the next steps that that we need to look into, Judy, for 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 this work that you're doing, this amazing work you're doing to go to scale. Um, I only have one slide, and it's a slide of a, uh, the, a picture of the grandmothers that work on um, on the friendship bench, which I just wanted to to um, to use to illustrate um, the power that elderly women in communities across Africa have, which um, really is what you've just heard focusing on, uh, on Senegal. A, a couple of years ago, when I used to do uh, a substantial amount of, um, of consultants is for the World Health Organization, I had the opportunity to travel to many different countries uh, in Africa. 
Um, and one of the things that was very conspicuous um, even then was the way research organizations, um, non-governmental organizations uh, were keen to exclude the elderly in, uh, in community related work. Um, the science was so much focused on, um, on trying to almost um, bring to, um, to Africa that which was perceived to be what worked in the North without taking into consideration the culture and the context and the role that the elderly, the, uh, um, the elderly communities in, uh, in, in, in African communities um, um, play. And so I think when we look at some of the lessons uh, from Africa, uh, say the HIV uh, you know, epidemic and the lessons of how uh, Africa navigated through that, I see a lot of resemblance in the role that grandmothers uh, in Senegal have played where they become you know, that vehicle for change um, particularly for, for younger people. Um, grandmothers um, providing or facilitating change, which we've just heard, and the grandmothers um, being the decision makers. There's this misconception again that um, it's the men that make all the decisions in Africa. One of the things we've learned from Friendship Bench is, is that the grandmothers are actually the custodians of the local culture and the wisdom. And Senegal is is producing exactly the same result. Um, so from a public health point of view, grandmothers are critical because they are dependable, they are reliable, and they are rooted in their communities. And they are part of the wider extended family concept. And so when I look at the work that, um, that you have been doing with the Grandmother Project um, in Senegal, and when I think of the African context uh, in terms of the value of elderly people, particularly elderly, elderly women, uh, this is a project or an initiative which can resonate with most African societies, most African communities. And, and I think the challenge that um, we need to start thinking of or looking at is how can this model be replicated? How can, um, can the work, the amazing work that you're doing in Senegal be, be replicated so that grandmothers um, uh, across Africa are integrated a lot more in the care and the development of, um, of girls in African communities, not only within the context of um, providing maternal and child health and preventing early pregnancies, but um, you know, education um, and, um, and, and some of the other issues around um, protecting the rights of, um, of girls in, um, in African culture. And we do know that um, you know, generally these grandmothers are, are rooted in their communities and they have a very good understanding of um, you know, a lot of the dynamics at play within families, within the communities uh, and with, within the wider um, social interactions and networks that exist. You know, there's, um, there's, uh, there's an African proverb which says, when your grandmother tells you something, you don't run to ask your mother whether it's the truth. But when your mother tells you something, you often will run to your grandmother to ask her if it is the truth. You know, and what we're seeing you know, with this uh, amazing work that you're doing, Judy, um, is, is that grandmothers can be brought to the center of the development of girls across Africa. There's also, there's also an element of cost effectiveness that we often talk about in public health, you know? Um, and, and you have these grandmothers who are not only rooted in their communities, but they are willing oftentimes to provide a service for free because they have vested interest in their communities. And from a public health uh, point of view, uh, 
empowering these women makes perfect sense for better development across across Africa, which is is what you are doing in your in your project. So I just like to conclude by 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 mentioning uh, the fact that they are um, although we have limited projects uh, across Africa which are emulating the work that that you are doing. Um, um, Judy in Senegal working with the elderly population because often when you think of the existing programs the, the focus is just young girls alone and exclude the elderly exclude the grandmothers because they are more likely to do harm than good but when you actually involve them in a meaningful way right from the beginning as you uh, beautifully highlighted through the process of using your theory of change and then coming up with the relevant questions and support, you get very positive results. But it's also about empowering the grandmothers, empowering them to be able to use the necessary tools that make them better communicators and able to reach out to help um, the girls within within their communities. So I, I think um, in conclusion, my key question is, how do you take this model to scale? How can this be replicated um, as we see it working in Senegal? How can it work beyond Senegal? I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dixon, for many, many things. First, the one minute 30 second that you are giving me back. I'm very thankful. And then the, the very invaluable insights that and, and point of reflection and questions that you are adding to Judy's and, and Angelie's presentation. Thank you so much. Um, again, people on the line, do not forget to make use of the Q&A box and you can actually vote so that I can, it can help guide me in terms of which question I, um, I, I send first the panelists. And while you are doing that, I wanted to, just share a couple of, of uh, points and, and reflection from my own perspective, just to add to Dixon's and Judy's one. Uh, you know, when I, I listen to the three of you, and of course, based on my previous work, I'm very inspired by uh, Amadou and Patiba. I didn't know, Judy, that you were going to, to quote him, but I, I can't refrain from, from insisting on that quote that you presented to say that, Whoever knows Ampateba knows that he is a, a champion of Africa's oral, oral tradition and, and traditional knowledge. Hence, he's saying that if an old man passes away, it's like a library, you know, a library that gets burned down. But uh, why am I mentioning that? Uh, for me, the statement like that shows the importance of culture. I'm sure Ampateba was not putting it in the context of social and behavior change, but I'm taking it to my advantage to say that it's really, it's really um, uh, a chance, it's a call for, it's a call for SBC practitioners to place um, the use of culture as an avenue for change in our African uh, communities or even in any other community, you know, the, I can come back to that, but building on, on cultural elements is very key and we need to find a way to do that building, Dixon, even uh, beyond going to scale or even before going to scale, how do we do that? Because there are so many other ways of replicating what the work of the grandmother's project, finding those cultural codes, those little intervention that will allow us through intergenerational communication and, and I'm sure there are maybe other things, today we're talking about grandmothers, but there are other elements, even the use of proverb Dixon that you just used, you know, it's so powerful, culturally speaking, in a given context. And when you start speaking like that in a rural community, you know, in, in Burkina Faso, where I am from, people will definitely think you, that you really make sense because you are credible, you speak their language and you use their code while you are talking to them. So that's something very important that I wanted to, to mention first. And the second element uh, or comment that I would like to make is that if we all agree that <laughs> culture has a place in social and behavior change, then we can easily agree that 
it's very important to have intergenerational approaches to bring change. And therefore, it's more than pertinent to build on elders and grandmothers, generally speaking. So by doing so, it's not only culturally appropriate, but because it's culturally appropriate because we show respect, we motivate people, but it's also strategically pertinent. I'm going back to, again, an element of Dixon's uh, intervention in terms of the cost, right? You know, it is there readily available. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, free, you know, quote, quote. And, and it's, it's really strategically important because we are simply utilizing another segment of the community to contribute meaningfully to the collective action that we are set out to do initially. So why would you want to do collect community collective action and forget about a segment of that community who could contribute for free? So it's, 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 strate it's so strategic to, to build our SBC intervention on, on, on such element. And I, I wanted to finish by saying that definitely social norms are a product of culture, you know, culture engenders social norm. And I've seen someone saying that in the, in the, in the chat box. And uh, the, starting, the starting point, so I would like to say that social norms are the product of culture and the starting point of changing social norms. And should be understanding that uh, I want to finish it there that culture or understanding cultural context is to social and behavior change what understanding the physical context is to dam construction. I want to repeat myself. If you are an engineer in hydraulic and you want to build dam, you really have to know your terrain very well. You need to know this, the landscape, the slopes, you have to study them so that when you build your dam, it can actually retain water. And for me, that utilization of the terrain, that knowledge of the terrain for physical work is comparable to social scientists or SBC practitioners trying to build on the understanding of cultural settings so that they can construct the social change from that. So I will stop there and uh, with the hope that you've gained a lot of insights and that triggers a lot of questions from your, from your part. I will now go to the question and answers box to see which question I will take and uh, toss it to our panelists. So, wow, okay. I got some, well, the first question that got, I think, nine <laughs> votes as, isn't this approach or research rather biased towards rural areas considering the rapid urbanization and the social breakdown in urban areas? What approach would you suggest for urban areas? So I'm going to give, sorry to be saying that, but I'm going to give you one minute, one minute for you, three of you to try to you know, share your insights to that, about that question. I repeat the question again. Isn't this approach slash research rather biased towards rural areas? Considering the rapid urbanization and the social breakdown in urban, sorry, uh, that was uh, a mix now. So, okay. And the social breakdown in urban areas, what approach would you suggest for urban areas? So it's the, the problematic of engaging communities on rural versus urban. What, what can you say about that question? So th there is another question that got the same number of votes, but I will start with that. Anjali, I have a specific question for you, so you don't need to answer that question. Please, Judy, go on that question that I'm asking, and Dixon will have a chance also to bounce on that. Um, yes, so what I can say is that uh, certainly, yeah, a grandmother inclusive uh, intergenerational approach has also been used in urban areas, widely in Senegal, 
by um, Child Fund in the area of maternal and child health. They've been using the approach in urban areas for a long time. And in terms of our work, we are now the, the, the area where Anjali uh, conducted the research and most of our work has been in rural areas, but it has now been expanded to urban areas. Uh, the urban dynamic is different, but the, and the challenges in terms of social cohesion uh, are greater, uh, which I think uh, contributes to or supports the need for this kind of approach because our belief and lesson is that unless there is uh, intergenerational and intergenerational communication and social cohesion, it is impossible for any community, urban or rural, to come together to work together to promote change for the benefit of, of others. So Thank you. there are Thank different you. contexts, but... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Dixon, your perspective on this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. So uh, just quickly, what we found with our work in the urban areas is that working with grandmothers and young people, we are creating this intergenerational connectedness, which is vital because it helps the young people to have a sense of belonging and creates a sense of purpose in young people. So with our work, we see, we see it working whether you're in urban or rural, or rural areas. It's the same thing. The needs are the same. Thank mm. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dixon. So, Anjali, a specific question for you. Mm -hmm. I will read it verbatim. For Anjali, I hear you saying that prior to intervention, communities considered grandmothers as living in the past and their opinions are outdated. I also hear you saying that grandmothers' opinions are deeply valued. Can you talk about this apparent contradiction? Yes, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, and, you know, I think we all live in lives that have contradiction to them, right? It's, it's inherent in humanity that our perceptions and our values and our actions can be in contradiction. And we make decisions that reflect some of those contradictions that are being negotiated. So when I said that about grandmothers, what I meant was that Grandmothers have a cultural and a historical role that is really deeply valued in these communities, that they are elders, they're advice givers, they are leaders, they are um, people that guide adolescents and parents as they grow and, and lead and make decisions. And that at the time when girls holistic development started, some of those social ties had broken. And so grandmothers had been a little bit sidelined in that traditional role of advice giving to girls and parents. It doesn't mean that grandmothers had no respect or were totally sidelined, but that respect for them existed, right? So people can interact with them in respectful ways and dismiss the considerations they have for girls' well-being. And girls' holistic development brought those two things together by saying, how do we rebuild connection, communication by building on culture and value. So those two things come together in more connection. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Anjali. Um, Judy, something for you specifically as well. Um, how, how, did you, how did you manage exit and sustainability of the grandmother project? And what are some of the challenges faced? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, in terms of, yeah, depending upon what we're referring to in terms of sustainability, the, the idea isn't to, isn't, are you talking about the sustainability of grandmother project, the sustainability of the changes in community, the sustainability of community capacity? Essentially, what, what our uh, objective is, as I mentioned, is to strengthen the leadership and capacity of communities to work together now and, and into the future. And so the sustain, what, what the, the, uh, the approach aims to strengthen the capacity of communities. And in terms of, of social norm, the sustainability of the social norm change, there are different aspects of social, really, I, what we have seen or what we believe is that something like child marriage, which is an ingrained social norm, that if the right, if, if it's an inclusive process and if 
there's a collective decision, then um, that can contribute to a change that will be sustained if the if the right people are are involved. And that's what we have observed in communities where uh, we haven't worked for 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 quite a few years. Uh, the, the the norms change in terms of child marriage and in terms of uh, female genital mutilation is still uh, is still um, intact. Um, yeah, lots of dimensions to sustainability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Judy. Uh, Lindsay, I, I really hope that we can also compile the questions from the Q&A chat because obviously we might not be able to answer all of them. There are some very good, all of them are really interesting and, and needs to be attended. Maybe we can compile them and try to, to answer them as we try to send something out as an output of this conversation. But there is a, a, a in the interest of time, we are like seven minutes before the end of the allotted time. I want to ask a very interesting question. Dixon, you will be first to answer that. And then if we have time, uh, Anjali and, and, and Judy can come on that question. So I will quote, there is a growing body of evidence that it is researchers based in the global north who dominate in the production of academic scholarship, which translate into the dominance of Eurocentric values, norms, and models in development theory and programs. Mm -hmm. This is arguably the case for social norms theories as well. My question to the speakers today, do you think that this could explain the neglect of local culture including the important role of grandmothers in development programming. Dixon has just alluded to this, but could you develop more? What could be the solution? How do we decolonize development practice? Again, that's a dissertation, right? But please, can you try to answer in a couple of uh, minutes? Dixon, let's start with you. Yeah, so the simple answer is yes. But um, I think context is important, regardless of where the researcher is coming from. And, um, you know, when we look at what is happening in Africa today, um, you know, there, there's a tendency in Africa itself to look up to institutions from the north and look down on institutions from within Africa. You know, so I think the solution is twofold here. We, we need to appreciate the historical um, context and roles that the elders have played in African society. And we need to elevate that um, involving communities. You know, when you start at community level, involving the people in the community, you will have something that is holistic and inclusive. Thank you, Anjali. Yeah, um, I, I agree with what Dixon said. I think it's very true that we have models of development that put power in the hands of the global north in terms of who gets funding, what decisions are made, how they're made, what research is done, and what questions are asked. And all of that influences what we see and what we think. So if um, me sitting in Washington, D.C. gets to design a study, I'll ask the questions that seem relevant to me and use the methods that seem relevant to me. But if we build partnerships and decenter the global north, that might create space for communities to actually enable their own solutions, which exists already. We just don't hear them. Thank you. Thank you. Judy, uh, one just, minute. Okay. No, I'll, I'll just add to that. No, I think this is a, a fundamental problem um, that the models, both for research and for programs, are based on uh, a Western notion of family, of, uh, of context. And um, I mean, I'm also very much involved in, for example, uh, in, in the field of, of nutrition and the tradition in nutrition up until now is that uh, programs on maternal and child nutrition focus on mothers and their babies and sometimes their husbands. 
where another field where the grandmothers across the globe, and especially in the, in the global south, are, are actively involved. But the, the models, the concepts that we use are not contextualized uh, to the, and, and important to say, not only the African reality, but the reality of uh, the non-Western world, which includes the global south, and also includes indigenous cultures in Canada, in Australia, and in, in the US, um, where um, the, uh, the models are not adapted. I read an article just, uh, just a couple of days ago written by feminist Native American, Native American women saying that white, the white feminist models do not fit the more collective spirit of Native American feminism. <laughs> So I think that's, uh, Annika's, uh, I see Annika asked that question. I think that's, uh, that's a fundamental challenge to rethink models and contextualize them as Dixon was saying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I think we need another hour or even more to kind of exhaust our, our curiosity on, on this topic. But I, I'm sorry, I, I have to, to stop here and, and invite us for a very quick exercise. One minute. Do you want to say something, Judy? Or? Oh, I, I think maybe you're going to say it, but, uh, but if, I'm not sure. Uh, no, I think what, what we are hoping, and in light of the very uh, strong interest in this webinar today, we are hoping that this can be the first step to in some form, whether it's a community of, of practice or whatever, to uh, orchestrating an ongoing dialogue on some of these issues in terms of culture and, and development practice. So we hope you were, yeah, uh, share your ideas along those lines, your interest in being involved. Thank you. Yeah, and the quick sharing of ideas, I don't want to miss that one, is this one. Oh. I have a question for you. Yeah. yeah. Please take one minute, go to the chat box this time, not the Q&A box, but the chat box mm -hmm. and answer this question. Just take one minute to write it. And when I say send, you will provoke a rain, an artificial rain from your chat box so that we can see all the ideas raining down in the chat box. And here is the question I would like you to answer. From what you've heard using the chat function, we would like for you to write in one thing that is particularly relevant for development programs where you are. One thing that you found relevant for development program from where you are right now, where you are working. Just take one minute, write it, hold on until I say send. That would be also our closing activity. Mm -hmm. Maybe I don't have a minute, but try try <laughs> try as much as you can to write something. I will go to the chat box. I will be monitoring it now and I will say send. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. If you have time, I will still give 30 seconds for people to go and read what others have said. And uh, while you are reading, I would like to still in the interest of time to, to say a big, 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 big thank you to Anjali, Judy and Dixon for your generosity for sharing for, for your insights. I personally found it very, very interesting. I'm actually frustrated that I'm a moderator and not a, a part of a discussion. I had to, <laughs> to watch that, uh, watch my mouth, not to interfere a lot, but yes, Judy. No, because I see someone said, I'm sorry, I can't see what everyone has had said in the chat. As okay. we said at the beginning, we're going to compile those and share those with everyone. Yeah. Otherwise, I don't know what device you're using, but otherwise you could use your cursor and go back up to be able to read what is in the chat. But they might yeah. not have time. Yeah, they might not have time to read it. We but will share with you yeah. all the questions and all the, the comments. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and as Judy said, we really hope that many of you will be interested in being involved in the community of practice that we hope to continue uh, in, the, in the near future and for quite some time. So uh, that being said, thank you so much everyone for joining us today for this conversation. This is the beginning of something. Thank, thank you, you. Talisbor. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you, Anjali. Bye. Thanks, Dixon.